So, good morning, everybody. Welcome to the latest edition of our Cover Talk uh, series of uh, webinars where we talk about uh, insurance uh, policy coverage uh, issues. Uh, my name is James Thompson. I'm a principal associate in Mills and Reeves Insurance uh, Disputes Group. I'm going to be talking to you this morning uh, about uh, consumer insurance. Uh, some uh, housekeeping before we get started. Um, this uh, webinar is being recorded, so if anyone's uncomfortable with that, then I'm afraid that you will need to uh, leave and uh, catch us up on uh, YouTube after the event. Uh, there's going to be a feedback form which will be shared uh, at, right at the end on your screen. Uh, I'm told that it's very quick to complete, uh, and uh, my colleagues in marketing would be very grateful if you would uh, fill that out for us. That's really uh, helpful. Um, if you have any questions that arise as we go uh, through the webinar, then please do uh, post those in the chat function and we will deal with those uh, at uh, the end. Um, and just to say, this morning is a bite-sized webinar, it's 15 minutes, but um, if actually any of this content or any of our other webinars uh, appeal to you and your teams, uh, do let us know and we can always prepare uh, a longer session uh, for you. Um, so do, do just get in touch uh, if you would like uh, We'd be interested in a, in a longer session designed directly for you. So let's get started. This morning, as I say, we're going to be talking about uh, consumer insurance. In particular, we're going to cover uh, what is a consumer, what is the definition of a consumer uh, under the uh, relevant legislation. We're going to have a look at the key features of the Consumer Insurance uh, Disclosure and Representations Act of 2012, or referred to that as CEDRA. And we will also touch at the end uh, on the FCA's expectations uh, for insurers and brokers who are dealing uh, with consumers. And we will uh, look also at the role of the Financial Ombudsman Service uh, in disputes which relate to uh, consumer insurance contracts. So who is a consumer? Well, CEDRA sets out right at the start of the act uh, the definition of a consumer. I've set it out on the screen. It's an individual who enters into the contracts wholly or mainly for purposes unrelated to the individual's trade, business or profession. Fairly straightforward definition, I'll give you some examples. If we think about a motor policy, uh, where an individual is uh, purchasing a motor policy for their own private use, uh, but you tick the box uh, on the proposal form uh, online saying that you would use your car for some limited business use, uh, that is going to be um, a consumer insurance contract, you will be a consumer for the purposes of the Act, because the dominant purpose of the uh, policy is for your private use, not for commercial use. If, however, you were a taxi driver and you were buying insurance uh, to cover your taxi, but you're also going to use that uh, taxi for some limited private use, uh, then uh, that contract would not be governed uh, by CEDRA, the taxi driver would not be a consumer uh, under the Act, uh, that contract would be governed uh, by the Insurance Act of 2015. And that's possibly a piece of legislation that a lot of us are far more uh, familiar with and come across uh, more often. And as we go through this morning's talk, I'll try and draw out some of the uh, similarities and differences between the Consumer Insurance Act and the Insurance Act. So let's move on then to have a look at the consumer's duty of disclosure uh, under CEDRA. It's a duty to take reasonable care not to make a misrepresentation. Importantly, it's not an obligation to disclose all material facts. And here's our first differentiator between uh, CEDRA and the Insurance Act, where you've got the duty of fair presentation and an obligation to disclose all material facts uh, under uh, the Insurance Act. Uh, that does not exist in CEDRA. There is no concept of materiality uh, it, it, under CEDRA uh, for uh, consumers. So it's a, a duty to take reasonable care not to make a misrepresentation. In practice, uh, that is going to mean answering insurers' questions um, as accurately and honestly uh, as you can. Uh, the onus, I think, is very much on insurers to ensure that the questions that they are asking of consumers uh, are uh, clear uh, and capable uh, of being answered um, in an accurate way. I flagged on the slide a, a question around auto renewal because uh, whilst you know, at the outset, pre-inception of a policy in its first year, um, a consumer will uh, fill out its proposal form, be it online or um, in some other format. Very often, particularly with consumer uh, policies, 
we see them being auto renewed. So you'll receive the email or you'll receive a text from your insurer saying uh, your car or your home insurance policy is going to renew on a given uh, date. Um, and a lot of the time it says you don't have to do anything. Um, and the car that you used last year will be used to pay for that, um, pay for your uh, upcoming uh, year's uh, renewal. So what then is the, is the uh, obligation on the consumer to make fresh uh, presentation uh, to the insurer? Well, the Act provides that there is an obligation uh, on a consumer to refresh information that it has uh, previously uh, provided to insurers. You know, as we all know, each in insurance policy year is a separate contract, and so there is a fresh obligation on the consumer. Uh, but in, if there is a dispute as to whether or not a consumer has made a misrepresentation uh, by not providing new information about some change in the risk from year one uh, to year two, um, then the evidential dispute is going to be around uh, the uh, format in which the insurer uh, presented the renewal uh, documentation or the renewal uh, reminder. How did they ask the questions? Did they make it sufficiently clear that there was an obligation uh, to uh, provide uh, fresh uh, disclosure or fresh answers uh, to questions? So I can see auto renewal uh, being you know, a real area for um, uh, disputes in this arena. Um, uh, and I think it's going to be difficult for an insurer, and they're going to have to show that their, uh, their auto renewal uh, documentation put the consumer in the best place uh, to make um, an accurate uh, presentation. Let's have a look at what the term reasonable care actually means. Uh, the Act is very helpful on this. Uh, it depends on all the circumstances of the case, and the Act provides uh, some examples of what will be relevant circumstances. Um, as I set out on the slide, the type of insurance, uh, the target markets that the insurer uh, is working uh, within, the insurer's expan ex explanatory material and its publicity material will be highly relevant, uh, and also the question of whether or not the insured have the benefits uh, of a broker to assist them uh, in uh, providing an accurate, uh, accurate answers to insurers' questions. The standards is objective, the burden is on the insurer, and the insurer only has to show what a reasonable person uh, would have known. It does not have to demonstrate what the particular consumer in the particular case uh, actually did know. So having set out what the consumer's duty of disclosure is, uh, how that works and how the Act uh, defines uh, that, that obligation, Let's have a look at uh, situations in which a con an insurer considers that a consumer has made a misrepresentation uh, to it. I've set it out on the slide. If the consumer makes a misrepresentation in breach of his or her duty, the insurer has a remedy if it can show that without the misrepresentation, it would not have entered into the contract or would have done so on different terms. And those of you familiar with the Insurance Act uh, will uh, be, will find this form of words uh, familiar because it's the same as that which we see uh, in the Insurance uh, Act. Uh, those are qualifying misrepresentations will be, which are the gateway uh, to an insurer being able to exercise uh, a remedy uh, against uh, a consumer policy holder. There are three types of qualifying misrepresentation uh, under CEDRA, deliberate uh, misrepresentations, reckless misrepresentations, or careless misrepresentations. The Act defines what a deliberate or a reckless misrepresentation is. A misrepresentation will be deliberate if the consumer knew that it was untrue or misleading, and a misrepresentation will be reckless if the uh, consumer did not care uh, that the information it was providing was untrue or misleading. Uh, and those definitions simply reflect, reflect the law uh, generally and what we would understand deliberate or reckless to mean uh, in other uh, contexts. So if an insurer is able to demonstrate that a consumer has provided a deliberate or a reckless uh, misrepresentation, what's its remedy? Well, it can avoid the policy, refuse all claims and keep the premium. And that position, again, is in line with the position as it would be under the Insurance Act 2015. The difference under CEDRA uh, is that uh, the insurer can keep the premium only to the extent that it would be unfair to the insured to keep the premium. So there will be some situations in which an insured uh, 
having made a deliberate misrepresentation to an insurer, will be entitled uh, to its premium uh, back. And that is a distinction uh, between CEDRA and the Insurance Act. Let's have a look at the third category of qualifying misrepresentations, uh, careless misrepresentations. Uh, careless misrepresentations are not defined uh, under the Act, um, but will be, uh, I think, you know, fairly easy to identify. Uh, there will be uh, inaccurate answers to insurers' questions uh, that have not satisfied the deliberate or reckless uh, hurdle. If an insurer can demonstrate that a consumer has made a careless misrepresentation, then the insurer is entitled to treat the policy as if, as if the misrepresentation has not, had not been made, and then to apply uh, proportionate remedies, which are set out uh, in a schedule uh, to the Act. And again, this will be familiar to those of you uh, who work in the Insurance Act uh, arena, because uh, the remedies and the mechanism uh, is very, very similar. If the insurer can demonstrate uh, that it would not have written the policy at all, uh, then it can avoid the policy and return the premium. If the insurer can demonstrate that it would have uh, imposed different terms, uh, if uh, true information has been provided to it, then it can apply those terms, be it exclusions, endorsements, any other terms. If the insurer uh, can demonstrate that it would have charged a higher premium, uh, then it is entitled to reduce its claim payment uh, proportionately. So, if an insurer says, well, had you answered this question accurately, I would have charged you a 10% higher premium, the insurer is entitled to reduce its claim payment by 10%. So the insurer's saving on the claim payment can be much greater uh, than the value of the additional premium uh, that it uh, would have charged. Uh, and I think the key issue with the application of all of these proportionate remedies is that the onus is going to be on the insurer to be able to evidence its underwriting process to demonstrate that it would have uh, treated the policy uh, in this way. An important distinction between the Consumer Insurance uh, Act and the Insurance Act uh, is how uh, policies can be treated uh, going forward. Uh, under CEDRA, uh, the insured can reject any new terms uh, that the uh, insurer proposes and give notice to terminate the policy. And equally, once insurers have dealt with any claims that are covered, uh, the insurer is entitled to give notice to terminate the policy, apart from in uh, the life insurance uh, context, uh, for obvious reasons. So the Act deals specifically with uh, situations arising in relation to group insurance. Uh, I'm talking here about uh, life and health insurance uh, policies. We think about policies where an employer might take out uh, you know, health insurance uh, policy uh, for uh, all of its perhaps hundreds or thousands of employees and various employees will be members of uh, that policy. Obviously, there are situations in which an individual can uh, provide a qualifying misrepresentation to the insurer. It can answer uh, questions posed by the insurer incorrectly, and the insurer will want a remedy uh, in respect of that. Now, the Act provides that where there is a qualifying misrepresentation, the policy will be treated as if there were a direct contract between the insurer and the consumer. Obviously, under a group policy, um, that is, that's not ordinarily uh, the case. So, that individual can have the remedy applied against it. Uh, the policy as a whole would remain in place. And that reflects a common sense position that just because an individual who has the benefit of a policy has made a misrepresentation, you would not want an insurer being able to avoid um, a health insurance policy um, for uh, you know, thousands of, potentially thousands of uh, members. So that's, that's, that's pretty straightforward, I say, I think reflects the common sense position as you would expect it to be. The Act also provides some useful guidance on uh, the role of the broker and identifying whose agent the broker may be in a given set of uh, circumstances. Um, situations in which a broker may be considered to act for the insurer uh, gives examples of uh, where the broker is the insurer's appointed representative or where the broker is acting under an express authority uh, from insurers. Uh, Situations in which uh, the broker may be considered to be acting for the insured and will therefore have the uh, heightened obligation to uh, provide uh, 
uh, accurate answers to insurers' questions, uh, will be uh, where the broker has provided uh, advice to the insured, or where the consumer is paying uh, the broker a fee. Um, and that's all fairly straightforward and reflects the position um, as we'd otherwise understand it. But as I say, the Act helpfully sets some of this out uh, in a schedule as additional guidance um, to parties where there may be a dispute as to exactly what role a broker was playing um, in, a, in a given uh, chain. So finally, I just want to touch on the role of the FCA and the Financial Ombudsman Service, uh, the interplay uh, between those bodies and the uh, Act. Um, obviously, we're all familiar with the obligation to treat customers fairly. Uh, that predated uh, CEDRA, which came in in uh, 2013. Um, uh, and uh, it, that is the, uh, the mantra and the principle by which uh, insurers and brokers uh, should be uh, treating their customers, particularly consumers. Um, I want to know special guidance in relation to vulnerable customers. Um, the FCA has had guidance um, uh, in relation to vulnerable customers in the past. Um, we're talking here about the elderly, uh, people with uh, mental uh, issues. Uh, the FCA has just completed a uh, further consultation close to the end of September. There's going to be updated guidance uh, from the FCA next year in relation to vulnerable customers. And I wanted to flag that because it's a particular uh, area of focus for the FCA. Um, and I think for any uh, insurers or brokers who are dealing with uh, vulnerable customers or potentially vulnerable customers, they should be uh, alive uh, to it. I flag the hazards of the Financial Ombudsman Service. The Ombudsman can be a difficult forum for insurers and brokers to uh, defend their work and defend uh, decisions that they uh, have made. Uh, and it is really important that, uh, that the questions that insurers are asking of consumers uh, are uh, clear. They are easily capable of giving uh, clear, transparent, transparent uh, answers uh, to. I think that you know, throughout this process of working with consumers, uh, insurers need to be uh, very much alive to the, their obligations uh, to treat the customer fairly and to put themselves in the best position to ensure that the uh, consumer, for the most part, is able to provide uh, accurate responses to questions. Uh, but where the situation goes wrong, where there is a dispute, uh, then that insurers are as insulated as they can be uh, from uh, a complaint uh, to the Ombudsman. So that's all I've got to say this morning. Um, as I said at the start, um, we've got time for questions now. If anyone has got uh, questions, please uh, type them into the uh, chat uh, function. Uh, I'm also being asked to let you know that next week we have no cover talk uh, webinar we're taking a break for half term but on the 5th of november uh, my colleague ben hardman will be talking about business interruption uh, insurance and he will no doubt be talking about the uh, fca uh, test case as well so that's on the 5th of november at uh, the same time uh, 11 o'clock so please sign up uh, for that um, if there are any questions um, then uh, type them in um, and otherwise thank you thank you very much for for listening to our webinar this morning james I just thought I'd say hello, Harriet speaking, hello, Harriet. to deal with your questions and answers. We do actually have uh, two uh, questions, three, two or three questions actually. Uh, one that we can deal with very quickly, there's a request for whether or not there'll be a recording of this to be circulated afterwards, and the answer to that is yes. If you signed up as um, an attendee, you will get a copy of the recording. Um, on a question of um, the actual content of your talk, however, you mentioned that the broker can be the agent for the insurer and separately for the insured. Can the broker be agent for both simultaneously, the questioner asks, and if so, are there any pitfalls that should be avoided if possible? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I've got a case at the moment, actually, I've been dealing with, with a broker who has found themselves in a position where they, they are acting for both a, a policyholder and for the uh, insurer, a you know, situation where a broker is uh, advertising its services as a, uh, a traditional broker to, um, to prospective policyholders, uh, but is also a cover holder uh, for um, an insurer. And uh, in that situation, um, the broker finds it itself acting for both policyholder and for insurer. Um, and that is very 
difficult situation, I think, for a broker to be in. You very quickly find yourself in a position where you have a conflict of interest. Um, so the answer to the question is, yes, it's possible. It's not a desirable situation for a broker to be in. Uh, it is, opens you up to uh, criticism, you know, the sort of um, you know, regulatory issues around conflicts that might uh, concern the FCA or the Ombudsman. Um, and there's the obvious obvious uh, potential for uh, claims in uh, negligence for uh, brokers who haven't satisfied their uh, duties to the policyholder um, uh, or potentially for a, a breach of a binder um, where you're acting as a cover holder. Thank you. What about the position um, with contracting out of CEDRA? We know that we can contract out of many parts of the Insurance Act. Does the same apply to CEDRA? Yeah, you, you, you can't effectively comply, uh, sorry, uh, contract out of uh, CEDRA. Um, insurers can offer no worse terms than CEDRA offers. So an insurer can't offer you know, more onerous disclosure obligations uh, to a consumer than, uh, than would be afforded under CEDRA. And, and my final question this morning is, is whether or not um, you can give us any examples of where the retention of a premium would not be, uh, well, would, would be unfair um, so that the insurers could withhold the premium and avoid the policy where there's been a deliberate or reckless misrepresentation by a consumer. Do you have any yeah. examples of that? Yeah, it's, it's, an, it's an interesting situation. I think that um, situation where you've got multiple policyholders potentially, so, you, you know, you may have, um, you know, um, household policy with a, a couple who've taken out a policy um, and uh, you know, maybe prejudicial to the um, to, to, to one or other of the, of the policy holders. I can think that would be a situation. Um, also any policy that's got a sort of um, investment element um, may be uh, difficult to um, with, withhold the premium in those circumstances. Um, but de definitely the sort of issue that I can see um, you know, coming up in front of the front of the Ombudsman, absolutely. Thank you very much, James. That's all we've got time for this morning, so I'll pass back to you to wrap up. Excellent. OK, well, thank you very much, everyone, for joining uh, this morning. Um, the uh, webinar is going to be available uh, later online. Um, as I say, if anyone is interested in the topic and would like uh, to talk to us about a, an extended uh, version, um, and that goes for, for any of the webinars that we offer under the Cover Talk uh, series, then please do get in touch. Uh, but otherwise, uh, thanks very much for listening and enjoy the rest of your day.